everyone. Thanks for coming. I am so excited to be up here and to be giving the storage innovation talk this year. Um, my name's Andy. I'm an engineer, and I work across our storage teams. And I've been at AWS for about six and a half years. Uh, prior to that, I was involved in a couple of startups. I've been a university professor. But the last six and a half years have been really, really incredible for me. I love working with our storage teams. And today, I get an hour to tell you about the work that our storage teams do and the ways that our customers use our storage products. And I'm really excited to do that. And so in today's talk, I thought what I would do is walk you through a set of stories about how storage works at AWS and, and how our teams build stuff. Um, one thing that I'd really like to start by emphasizing is unlike other aspects of our services, our storage services don't tend to get a lot of really big, exciting launches. We tend to be behind the scenes and underneath a lot of other product launches and a lot of other really cool features that are built over AWS. And working with our teams, I'll tell you, the teams really kind of like that, right? There is a humble pride, I think, in building services that continuously improve year on year. And so internally, as storage builders, we really kind of look at our services in terms of these fundamentals, durability, security, availability, and performance. And we're constantly focused on improving those aspects of our systems. And that constant focus, that continuous, transparent, invisible in innovation inside our systems is something that I think is probably one of the most wonderful and also really, really interesting aspects of our storage services. So, so a nice term to talk about continuous innovation, but it's probably a lot easier to relate to if I make it concrete. And so I'd like to start with one of our services. Has anyone here ever heard of EBS? It's, it's uh, one, of our, one of our storage services. Um, EBS turned 15 this year, right, our, our block storage service. And so I wanted to spend some time in today's talk telling you about EBS. And I, I sat down with the team and we put together some, some content about EBS that I think you're really gonna like. First of all, EBS is kind of an engineering marvel at this point, right? 100 trillion I.O. operations every single day. 390, more than 390 million EBS volumes are created every day, and EBS transfers over 13 exabytes of data every day. The activity in EBS storage alone is just astounding. And so in putting together a, a bit of a, a story about continuous innovation in EBS, I asked the team to go and look at how long the longest lived volumes inside EBS have been in service. Anybody want to guess how long the longest EBS volumes have been in service? It turns out that there are a sizable number of volumes that were created the day after EBS launched, still in service today. And so there are volumes still serving virtual machine workloads, still taking I.O., still actively running workloads above EBS that were created 15 years ago. And so it's fun to think about the continuous innovation in the service through the lens of those teenagers, right? They're, they're almost old enough to get their driver's license at this point. And so as we go back early on in the history of EBS, the product page kind of looked like this. And if we think about the first few years of the service running and how EBS was built, all of EBS's volumes were hosted on top of hard drives, right? This is the inside of a hard drive. And so this makes sense at the time. It's, you know, 2008 to 2012, and this is still kind of the dominant media for, um, for, for storage and data centers. And hard drives are kind of interesting, right? Inside, they're like record players. You have this armature. The armature moves back and forth. And virtualizing a hard drive is not the same as virtualizing a CPU. Virtualizing a CPU is reasonably straightforward, not trivial. Uh, but virtualizing a hard drive, because of the mechanical motion of the arm, hard drives go really, really well if you're reading in a straight line. And when you go and do a random access, the arm has to move and the disk has to spin and you waste milliseconds of time waiting for your data to become available. Which is why for like 40 years of file system design, file systems have worked really, really hard to lay out data on disks to move that arm as little as possible on the hard drive. And so with a hard drive based block virtualization layer, which EBS was, as soon as you add the second workload, 
things stop going as well. It gets a lot harder. It's a, it's a, a like more than linear um, delay or decay because those workloads interleave and you end up seeking like crazy. And so this was the reality approaching 2012 with EBS that the performance wasn't where the team wanted it to be and it was a structural problem with the mechanics of these hard drives. And so this is a great story of reinvention inside AWS and it's one that has, you know, tons and tons of examples through the years. But the EBS team sat down and thought about what they would do. And they looked at deploying SSDs. But SSDs at the time, still relatively early days, were very expensive. And so it wasn't realistic to deploy SSDs for the entire fleet of EBS. We had to be more surgical than that. And so what the team did was they made a software change to the design of EBS to move all of the write path first onto SSDs and then write from SSD to hard drives asynchronously after the fact. And by moving those recent writes onto SSDs, we could deploy a smaller amount of SSD into the fleet. Right? We could get a lot of value out of it. But also, since storage requests tend to exhibit a lot of locality and time, a lot of temporal locality, reads often hit the data before it was written out. And so you get this reorganization where a lot of the traffic can move to SSDs, and we can, at our leisure, sort of delay writing it out to hard drives and make good decisions about where the data is placed on the hard drives. So really good change. However, Deploying this into the EBS fleet, right, the software was only the first step. We had to qualify the environmentals and make sure that there was like suitable thermals to be able to add new hardware into these servers. We had to make sure that we had a plan to do it safely and transparently under the fleet of all these running virtual machines. There was tons and tons of preparation and planning that went into this. It's effectively changing the engines on a plane while it flies. And so over three months, we managed to replace our install SSDs into tens of thousands of EBS servers. Now this is a bit that I'm really excited to share with you because as I was talking to the team about this, this is before my time and whenever you ask about this stuff at Amazon, incredible stories come out about sort of the, the innovation that folks did. Um, this is one of the SSDs and that's Velcro. Um, it's heat resistant Velcro which is a thing that I didn't know you could purchase prior to preparing this talk for you. Um, and so there weren't three and a half inch drive slots inside these servers and we had to figure out where to put these SSDs and so that's the SSD and that's the SSD inside the server. And this was how EBS initially adopted solid state storage. Now, none of these servers are still in the EBS fleet. In fact, we're a few generations past these servers but, but this is how EBS evolved into solid state early on in the, in the um, evolution of it as a product. Now, EBS, you know, that's four years in and there was a lot of innovation that happened prior to that but since then we've innovated across the stack. And this is true of all of our products. I could tell you a similar story for S3, a similar story for EFS probably. Um, but if you really want to see it in EBS, let's just look at a write request, right? So there's a, a VM in the top left and there's a write leaving the application, flows through the operating system, hits the NVMe interface and thinks it's talking to a local SSD, but it's not. It's talking to EBS. And so we use Nitro. The request moves out through Nitro over the network. The request is replicated to a few other EBS servers. It's acknowledged quickly after being written to persistent storage and then returned to the client and all of this happens in under a millisecond. And I can call out, I mean, I would happily spend the rest of the afternoon telling you about all of the pieces of this. It's so neat, all of the levels of things that have happened inside EBS, but just to call out a couple. The Nitro system underneath EBS is so remarkable and it's so powerful as a storage posture. We never want to see customer data, right? It's, it's absolutely critical and we're ruthless about not ever seeing customer data, but the OS thinks it's talking to a local SSD and it's writing clear text over that wire. And so Nitro gives us a posture that is secure and local to the host where we can encrypt that data before it ever leaves the host. It's a really, really powerful posture. At the same time, Nitro is not stealing resources from the CPU that the instance is using, right? Which means that all of those resources are the customers to use. The SRD protocol is something that Peter talked about last year. It's a, a transport protocol that we use in our data centers to replace TCP that's designed for low latency and to quickly write around failures. Um, Nitro SSD and Graviton I'm sure you're familiar with. Nitro SSD is, a, is an SSD that we built from scratch at AWS, the flash translation layer using commodity uh, media cards. So over the course of those 15 year teenage volumes lives, right, 
the amount of improvement that's happened in the experience of running an EBS volume is incredible. From 100 IOPS, 100 operations per second at launch, to over 400,000 IOPS per volume on our fastest instance today. It's just unbelievable the level of improvement across the lifetime of these volumes. In November, we launched EBS IO2. Block Express is available on all um, Nitro uh, enabled instances. Uh, IO2 Block Express is our fastest volume type. Uh, it's capable of, uh, of incredible performance and latency and is our most durable volume type. It's a SAN style volume. And so that's a theme of all of our storage services with EBS as an example. Continuous, seamless innovation over the entire lifetime of these services. I'd like to switch gears now and talk about performance a little bit. And I'm going to talk about performance through the lens of S3. Um, S3 has, S3 is our oldest uh, storage service, 17 years old. Um, and S3 has been storing customer data and uh, served as a basis increasingly for data lakes and applications for almost two decades now. And a thing that we've noticed over the past, especially, I don't know, three or four years, is we're being pulled closer and closer to applications. Customers really want to use S3 as a primary data store. And so over that period of time, the performance asks that customers were making kind of changed. Originally, S3's performance shifted from being sort of an archival store to being a throughput focused store where customers would run huge parallel throughput analytics jobs. And this is a pattern that we see today very actively, hundreds of terabytes of second into single workloads onto S3. But now as we move further, customers are asking us to move out of the sort of shipping truck type of throughput to the bicycle courier type of low latency, right, fast interactive performance from storage. And so, this throughput versus latency aspect of storage is, it's, it's a little bit of a nuanced topic. So I, I just want to explain to you why it really matters and how it's interesting. Here's a simple example of querying a table. We can think about this as looking through a parquet file. Um, and I've drawn my disk and my CPU. And if I implemented this in a really, really basic way, I would read from the disk, I'd take the data from the disk, I'd process it on the CPU. And then I'd read my next data from the disk and then I'd process it on the CPU. And as you see, I'm idle half of the time. I'm not making great use of my resources because the CPU is always waiting on the disk. Now, if things were perfect, I would fully pipeline this, right? I would run all of my um, transfer from the disk in the background and process it as I went, right? This is kind of the ideal for making excellent use of storage. And if you think about, you know, machine learning workloads, which we'll talk about later, and expensive GPUs, this is absolutely what you want, right? You want to keep the GPU busy because that's the most expensive part of the system. And so the problem, the challenge with getting to that fully pipelined thing is that there's data dependencies in the storage. So if I go back to that example of a parquet file, at the end of the parquet file, there's a footer, and the footer is the metadata for all of the, all of the uh, rows and columns of data that are inside the parquet file. And so I have to first read the footer. I actually have to read a pointer that's after the footer to figure out where the footer starts. And then I read the footer, and then I can go read my data. And so those yellow blocks inside the data kind of represent those pointers, and I can only pull forward that pipelining of requests to the point that I know which data I need to read next. Right? And so this is a challenge. And so to speed this up, the best I can do is make my reads faster. Right? If I reduce the latency of my reads, then I can get closer to that pipeline type performance. And so if you look inside those reads, there are really two things happening. The second thing that happens is the obvious thing. It's transferring the data back to you on the read. The first thing that happens is everything else. It's requests being queued, waiting to be submitted to storage. It's metadata lookups, it's authentication and authorization and network latency all getting to the data. But if we can speed all of this up, what happens is some cool animation. This is the whole thing pulls in and our workload goes faster. And the faster that I can speed up those requests, the faster my workload goes. And so reducing latency really, really helps workloads that have a lot of data dependencies. And it also really, really helps workloads that have humans involved in them. Right? If you have creative professionals, folks editing video, clicking the mouse and waiting for data to come off of storage, right, they're very, very sensitive to latency. And so the lower that you can make latency, the more responsive your applications are for those folks. These are the two things. And so um, a few years ago, uh, one of the other engineers in S3 and I, 
uh, Seth Markle, started looking at this problem. We were being asked a lot by customers around whether there was something we could do with S3. And so we did a pile of prototyping and looking at what it would take to make S3 run in a better domain for latency. And we learned all sorts of interesting stuff. It was, it was like surprisingly more complicated than I think either of us expected when we started. One thing we learned was that S3's regional design worked against latency. I guess this is intuitive, but it wasn't to us at the time. Like there's a lot of internal um, round trips inside of S3 to make sure the system is, is functioning at a regional level. And so we realized if we wanted to build something that was going to have really, really responsive latency, we're going to have to move to a single zone product. Um, we found out that inside the request processing path, there was a lot of work that happened every single request. And there was an opportunity to pull that out into a session level set of state that we could establish with the SDK up front and make requests go faster. And so all those artifacts that I mentioned on the read side were things that we could tackle. And so today, as you heard in Adam's talk this morning, we're delighted to tell you about this new offering from S3. S3 Express One Zone. This is a single zone S3 bucket that is about 10 times lower latency than regional S3. Single digit millisecond latency and the ability to do millions of requests per minute. There are three really big properties that I can tell you about inside of uh, One Zone. The first one is we're launching, and this is probably the biggest aspect of it, we're launching directory buckets. This is the first new bucket type that we've ever had in S3. Directory buckets are a reinvention of how we work with metadata, the session level protocol talking to the data in S3, and it's designed for very high TPS workloads that need very low latency. As I mentioned, we're also um, delivering this as a single zone product, which gives you the ability to co-locate compute next to the bucket in the zone where you place it. The bucket still is available as anywhere else in terms of, uh, of sending requests, but it's a single AZ construct, so it's, it's only as available as the, as the AZ itself. And finally, um, one zone is based on top of high performance storage media. Let's talk about what this means from a workload perspective. So this is in uh, a machine learning um, image training workload using the ImageNet data set. This workload runs for about 15 days if you do it end to end. And on the left, I'm showing you the workload running against uh, S3 regionally and on the right against uh, S3 Express. The white plot at the top of the graph is the CPU. CPU is really busy in this workload, right? It's moving a lot of data back and forth. The GPU is the pink plot. And the valleys that you see in the GPU on the left are the GPU waiting for storage. Right? The GPU is outrunning the transfer of these images in for it to process. And so by moving to a lower latency store, you see the GPU become more utilized and it shaves a day off of that 15 day runtime and it shaves 16% off the cost of this workload because you're running the whole job for less time. Now we can answer really important questions with this kind of insight like is that a chihuahua or a muffin? And so the, the storage teams have this amazing set of, um, um, of essays and there's a team within them that does workload validation. They work really closely with customers to understand performance dimensions of storage workloads and they sat down and, and put together this, this S3 Express demo of just running this classifier against um, both types of storage and you can just see very responsibly how much faster we're able to work through the data without changing any of the software, right? We just changed the bucket that we were working with. Um, Pinterest uh, has uh, um, had early access to this and they've been working on it for a recommendation engine inside of uh, uh, their system. The experience that they've had is that um, their, their tasks run about 10 times faster and they've been able to reduce costs by 40%. If I step back, um, I'm borrowing a, a sort of visualization here out of like computer architecture texts, right? This is the memory hierarchy like you might see on a CPU, right? With registers and cache at the top and then main memory. I've just like carried it down to think about the entire storage stack. And as you can see, we've got a portfolio of storage products that you can think about from a latency perspective. And this is really how we're approaching things. We want to make sure that you have the right tool to bring to whatever job that you're trying to do on top of our storage. Now, of course, there are other dimensions that we could look at this with. Um, Glacier Deep Archive at 12 to 48 hours retrieval uh, costs about a dollar per terabyte. It's an incredibly effectively priced product, right? There are durability trade-offs and so on. But in terms of latency, there's a really rich set of tools that you can bring to your storage workloads. 
And that's where we'll go, is performance for every workload on top of, uh, of our services. Now, at this point, I'd like to give you a little break from me, and I'd like to invite Marianne Johnson out. Um, Marianne is, um, is the, uh, uh, the uh, chief product officer at uh, Cox Automotive, and she and her team have been working at Cox, I think she's been there for almost six years now, and her story and the, the, the work that she's done at Cox in terms of uh, cloud transformation and working with all of the various Cox businesses is absolutely incredible. And so I was so happy that she agreed to come and, and tell you about their experiences. And so let's have Marianne come out now. Hi, Marianne. There you go. Thank you very much. Well, I'm thrilled to be here today with all of you, and I'm going to share some thoughts about the Cox Automotive journey in just a few minutes. And it is about our cloud journey and our data first journey. And I'm gonna share a few things really about the journey and, and the steps that we took. A lot of things that we did that we find that were successful. I also wanna tell you some of the tried and true measures that we've been able to use to get to where we are today. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Cox Automotive. We are roughly about a $9 billion company, part of Cox Enterprises. And we serve the entire automotive ecosystem through software, through services, and many different types of capabilities. But we've grown through acquisition. We are over 70 different acquisitions. And in those acquisitions, you can only imagine what came with that. We had different skills. We had different levels of maturity. We had different levels of types of tech stacks. And it was quite an interesting ecosystem. And in that, um, we were able to start a transformation journey. And we made a decision in 2018 to run like one Cox Automotive. And you say, what does that mean? Well, that really means that we went from a product-centric organization to an enterprise-type organization, meaning that we wanted to be solution-focused. And the journey that we've been on has enabled us to do that, to actually help our customers thrive in a marketplace that is really changing very rapidly. And today we have, across all of our brands, solutions that are helping us do just that. Now our journey started before I actually even started with Cox. I started in 2018. And my very first day on the job, I found myself in Seattle at the AWS offices. Because just before starting, the company made three key decisions. One was that we needed to get out of the 53 different data centers that we had, and we needed to go to the cloud. So there was a decision there. The second decision is that we needed to implement Agile as a business methodology. And the third was that we needed to be way more intentional about our data. So when I came back from being in Seattle, it became very clear to me that I had to resell the leadership team on why we needed to go to the cloud. It wasn't just about taking expense out, it really had to be about having a nimbleness, having an agility to grow. So that was a big deal. So we started on our journey. We talk about our data back in 17 and 16 being swampy. And we really kind of had to get out of that. So be super intentional about that. The levers that we used have really been able to get us to where we are today. And I will tell you what's been interesting about that is today, so four years later, we are all in on AWS. We have over 500 workloads in the cloud. We have um, our data in a marketplace in one component that we call DriveQ. And it has ubiquitous access across our entire ecosystem. And those have been keys to unlocking value. Just to give you a feel for the kind of productivity that's come out of these moves, on average in our ecosystem, we launch anywhere from 20 to 30 new products a year. We do over 10,000 feature enhancements to our ecosystem and over 80 new integrations every year. And we wouldn't be able to do that if we had not made this journey. And going all in on our cloud and our data journey was key to that success. We had to do that not only with AWS, but with the partners that were part of the ecosystem there. That was key. And you know, if we think about the data, you heard a lot this morning about how important it is. To be able to go fast and create differentiation, you've got to be super intentional about your data. We did all the things you have to do, how you ingest, how you acquire, how you make sure you take care of data exhaust, how you catalog it, index it, and make it available. 
So that changed even our model delivery. We do a lot of model delivery. We went from quarters, we went to months, we went to days, and now we're deploying new models and hours. So significant change. And one of the keys to our success was being nimble in how we did it, asking ourselves where we were getting in our own way, and be willing to change those things and be able to level up. I heard the phrase this morning, race to the top. I wrote that down, that's sticking. It's how do we level up? And that's been key to our journey. Now I wanna bring it to life for you a little bit more. It isn't about those data centers. Remember I said 53? We retired 50 of those data centers. We only have three now. And that is for the environments that are not fit for purpose for the cloud. We are all operating in the cloud. But we had to think about how do we maintain the right amount of cost, elasticity, but turn on speed and innovation? And that's been a big part of what you see here. It's personalization now that is available through our data. It's also advanced imaging that plays a part in our ecosystem. And it's also about conversational AI. How do we engage with our consumers? How do we engage with our customers? All those things are happening now through recommendations. If you've ever been on Kelly Blue Book, if you're on AutoTrader, and then how we help our retailers connect with their consumers. It's all now happening and it's been made real. And so those things are just to, to name a few, but at the end of the day, we couldn't do any of those if we weren't that intentional about our data. It all starts with the data. Now, once you have the data, then you can apply your advanced techniques, whether it's machine learning, natural language processing, or computer vision. And those are all things that are artificial intelligence and give you the right jump off point to be able to go after Gen AI. Now I wanna bring, give you a couple examples. We talked about personalization a second ago. I don't care what business you're in, whether it's a B2C, B2B, B2B2C, personalization is a big deal. We created a, a product um, embedded in our e-commerce solutions called Magic Qual. Magic Qual through our AI technology and our data is a feature that's embedded in those e-commerce platforms that actually will enable a consumer, if you were buying a vehicle, would only get five pieces of information from you, do a soft credit pull, and we could tell you exactly what your monthly payment would be, and knowing that you could get financed and a loan for that, for sure, so you would have confidence in that. Then it becomes all about making it personalized to you. What vehicles are you interested in? That's all data-driven, and now we know what you can afford. And so the ability for us to actually get a consumer to buy a vehicle, their affordability and their interest, those that engage with the Magic Qual, 10 times are more likely to put that vehicle in their shopping cart, and for those that do that, are two times more likely to actually purchase the vehicle. So it's a big deal when you're leveraging your data. Now, what do you do when you have access to millions and millions of vehicles? You image them, and then you use our patented technology to turn that into a digital twin. And that is what we've done. Our fixed imaging tunnels and our mobile capture, it's our patented fusion technology, that is set a new standard in the industry, industry for vehicle imaging. And it's an industry first. Our fits, as we call them, the tunnels, actually produce uh, through 50 different cameras, we have over 90 different light panels that produce over 2,500 images that allow us to produce 90 images that are assessed and then pick the actually best 12. And what happens from that is those images are so high res, you can see road rash on, a, on the vehicle, you can see a scratch on the tire, you can actually read the text on the side rim of a wheel. So it gives so much confidence. If you're the seller of the vehicle, you know what you need to do to recondition and what your return on investment should be for that vehicle. If you're a buyer, it gives you the confidence of what's the actual condition of the vehicle and gives you comfort in the purchase that you're making. And just one more example to bring it to life. Because we've done so much with AI, AI is not new to us, and what we've done with our data, we've been able to step into what I call pragmatically aggressive, and I'll say that again, <laughs> pragmatically aggressive on Gen AI. And we've been able to do that, and we're already starting to see some differentiation for solutions that we can serve our market better. And I will tell you that because we've done what we just talked about, the experimentation is happening rapidly. So we're really excited about the potential promise of what we're seeing there. So our AI practices are now leveled up. I have a lot of engineers, I have over 100 here at the conference today, and they're all getting access to be able to play and use and learn rapidly. 
So just a couple of examples. We do a lot of contact communication with our customers and with consumers, but we also believe that Gen AI is going to be able to make that communication more relevant, more timely, and more personalized. So we're pursuing that. If we think about what we do is manage search engine, engine optimization, so SEO, we believe that we can do that with higher quality, we can do it more efficiently, and we can generate revenue for that. So those are just two examples of many examples that we have in flight right now. So my advice to all of you is just to get started. And what I have shown up here, I am not going to unpack this, but if you want to take a picture, I would suggest that you do. These principles that we share up here are our key success factors in how we went to the cloud, the buy-in from our business leaders, as well as our data journey. We all know that the data space and the AI space is moving rapidly, and you cannot sit on the sideline. You need to make decisions. So I would encourage you to lean in, be in it, be in motion. I'm, you know, as I'm not unpacking this, I also want to tell you that these actions up here are very actionable. They're great tips for how you want to move forward in your organization. To leverage your data, leverage your position, so that you can take advantage of these advanced techniques. And I talked about being all in with AWS and their partners, and I'll give a shout out to RapidScale, which is a Cox company, which is in that partner ecosystem who can help you. But that is how we have leaned in. We've taken advantage of everything. And what I heard this morning excites me. So we are gonna race to the top with what's next. I would leave you with radical transparency, manage your expense along the way, show value as you go, let that build momentum, but focus on outcomes. If you haven't started, start. If you're early in, lean in and accelerate. And if you're all in like we have been, I wanna to talk to you because I'm pretty sure we can learn something from each other. So thank you very much and I'm gonna turn it back over to Andy. Thanks Marianne. Wasn't that cool? The, the car video, the car video is really neat. Um, the story is, is so, Wonderful, and it's, it's, it's actually representative of a lot of um, these enterprise migration stories. I mean, Cox is, they've been so incredible in terms of execution, but it's, it's a pattern that we're seeing other places. And so, with the second half of the talk, I'm gonna spend some time talking to you about sort of three directions that we see um, customers, you know, sort of pulling us in um, from the perspective of storage services. And the first one is migrations. And, Migrations historically have been a reasonably boring thing to talk to a room about when it comes to storage, right? It's usually a cost-focused thing. Um, it's a bit tedious and so on. The, the reality, though, is we've seen a really interesting shift in migrations for storage, I think, over the past few years. A couple of things have happened. First of all, a lot of customers, even enterprise customers that have incumbent data in enterprise managed storage are just building in the cloud. So there's a workload transformation that's happening where people are building from scratch applications over these services while still maintaining that estate. But the other thing that's really interesting to have seen happen is there's forklift upgrades, right? Things like SAP HANA, VMware being moved over. This is probably what you'd expect. Similarly, there's data protection and recovery type workloads, right? Instead of building a second data center or getting colo space where you have to also provision compute, people are replicating storage to the cloud. The third case is really interesting. The third case is we're seeing customers realize that there's an enormous amount, obviously, of value in the data that they're hosting on those enterprise storage targets. But there's an equivalently enormous amount of value available in the services that they can build on top of it and the scale that they can analyze that data with in the cloud. And so we're seeing a lot of migrations actually being driven by a desire for a transformative change to be able to bring new workloads to data that has potentially been curated and built over decades. Right? And, and this is a really, really interesting shift. Now, the products that we build at AWS specifically for these migrations are the FSX series of storage products. These are single tenant products. Um, what we hear from storage admins that are looking at doing migrations to the cloud is they really want to buy storage that looks a lot like the storage they already have, right? They want stuff that's integrated and easy to work with. And so with FSX uh, for ONTAP, with NetApp ONTAP, where we've partnered with NetApp, it is a NetApp product 
right? Uh, AWS and NetApp partnership offering NetApp on tap storage systems over FSX in the cloud. You can turn on SnapMirror and replicate data into NetApp running over AWS. Windows File Server is another popular FSX, and then we have two uh, open source based offerings, ZFS and Lustre. Today, we are announcing uh, new support for scale out facilities within FSX NetApp on tap. Um, this is a, a pretty sizable performance bump in terms of cluster capabilities. These clusters can now scale on SSD up to 1.2 million IOPS for the, for the file target and 36 gigabytes a second. And this feeds directly into that use case that I was telling you about. You can mirror your data into a scaled out on tap cluster and suddenly now you can use a GPU cluster to do training or fine tuning on that data. Or you can launch 10,000 lambdas against that data and really draw a lot of um, analysis potential off of it at a level that you probably wouldn't buy compute for as a single owner. Um, eHealth, e -Health, New South Wales, um, is an example of, a, of an ONTAP customer that's done a migration like this. They migrated 1.3 petabytes of uh, medical imaging data um, and saw a $16 million cost savings through that process. They were able to reduce the, um, uh, the, the image fetch time by 10x, and they were able to shorten the delay for a negative COVID result from 10 days to one hour after this change. So customers often look at migration as a starting point of a, of a transformative change, right? They're really focused on the data and how a migration opens up new capabilities. Let's shift and talk about similar examples of working with shared data and data being at the center of like a long-term investment in, in building. And so this is where we talk about data lakes, analytic services. And so from a storage perspective, this has been a remarkable area for well over 10 years now. It's like every year there's exciting new things happening in the way that, that we can work with, with data. Um, anecdotally, something that we see is that uh, data growth inside customers, data lake customers, is exponential. We see typically about a 10x increase in the amount of data under management over a five year period. Um, we see data coming from all sorts of new sources, increasingly diverse data formats on disk, and a really sweeping set of new tools. And this is where the data lake pattern, right, that term actually has meaning. And so it's worth talking about it for a second. Uh, on S3, today, we have over 700,000 data lakes. And the data lake term is, uh, when it was introduced, is, is uh, introduced in contrast with the idea of a data warehouse, right? Like historically, the idea of data warehousing was that you would establish a schema up front, you would load it, and you would interact with your data over that query engine. Right? The idea of a data lake is we still want those facilities, absolutely, but we're going to decouple it. And we're going to make a decision to store our data in a shared storage substrate. We're going to establish file formats that our tools can work with. We may build a warehousing facility on top of it, but our teams are still free to bring other tools to work with that same data. And that flexibility to bring other tools to work with the data is the thing that lets teams go and have ownership and freedom to go and decide to play with PyTorch, right, and do a bunch of machine learning or experiment with new query engines or other tools. They can go and stand up their own software directly working on that data, whether it's in a container or a Lambda or a VM. S3 is obviously at the center of a lot of data lakes. Um, I think S3 is, is especially attractive uh, as a substrate for data lakes, as a storage substrate for data lakes. Uh, Notably because of the fact that there's no storage management involved. You don't provision, you don't plan for capacity, you just use the storage. The scale of S3 and the ability to elastically scale performance up to hundreds of terabytes of throughput into a single data set is a burst capability that is very difficult to replicate in a storage system that you built for a single tenant. And so that's been something that's allowed people to get incredible performance for jobs, whether it's genomics analysis or querying data on top of S3. And the other facet of S3 that's incredibly powerful is all of the integrations and partnerships that we have, whether it's AWS analytic services and databases or partner services like Snowflake and Databricks that can be brought to bear. So I'm gonna quickly tell you about two things that we've seen in data lakes over the past, um, past year especially. I reinvent last year, um, 
in almost every single conversation that I had with customers that were building data lakes on S3, we talked about Iceberg. Customers were bringing it up. Um, Iceberg is an example of what's being called an open table format. Um, and the idea with these open table formats is to build a first class table abstraction for data stored on object stores like S3. Um, it's really, really remarkable what's been achieved in here. All three of these examples, Iceberg, Hootie, and Delta Lake are formats to build tables, tabular content over, um, over existing storage. And they solve for a whole bunch of challenges that customers have had in the past working with just plain parquet or columnar formats on top of the object store. To pick an example, a common use case here is uh, log data, right? You're writing out log data to storage. And at some point in the future, you want to retire that log data. And so there's mutation. In this simple case, it's a pend only mutation, but I'm still adding and removing data from the table. If I'm issuing transactions against that directly against the parquet, I need to be resilient against those files getting deleted under my feet. I need to be listing all of the files to figure out what's there, and I need to be working across all those files in my table. By moving to something like Iceberg, you get an indirection layer that provides serializable transactions against the data, so that query is not going to interfere with mutations to the table. You get improved performance because it's managing naming and layout inside the object store. Uh, you get the ability to evolve the schema by adding or removing columns, for example. And because these systems are snapshot based, you can travel back in time and issue queries against past states of your data. So it's a really profound change to this. There's an enormous set of tools evolving around these open table formats, and the pattern looks basically like this, that there's S3 at the bottom, an open table format in the middle, and some analysis tool or analytics tool at top. Um, it's worth diving in for a moment and just giving you a little bit of a view of how these things work internally because it's, it's I think, helpful to have a, a kind of a, a mental model around this. And so if we look inside Iceberg as an example, we can really split it up into these three components, right? At the bottom, you've got your data files, right? These are Parquet or other columnar uh, data files at the bottom. At the top, there's a catalog. And the catalog is responsible for telling you about your tables, telling you about the snapshots that exist in the past, and handling updates and making sure that they're serialized appropriately. In the middle, there's a bunch of metadata that also ends up being written into S3. And the metadata summarizes the views that you have of your data across those files. And so as an example, if I had a giant you know, table existing in Parquet and I changed a few rows of it, I would write out a new Parquet file that just had those changes and I would update the metadata to say here's what I overwrote and here are the ranges that are different. And so that's how I can work uh, from a query engine or from interrogating the data to understand what's changed. Now, it's really, really powerful. One side effect that proves to be a little bit challenging, especially if you're doing lots of steady state writes, is you create a lot of small parquet files. And the query performance off of those files is considerably worse than if you were just doing big reads out of a single large object. And so last month, uh, Glue Data Catalog launched automatic compaction of Apache Iceberg tables. And so this is an example of the direction that we're watching these workloads evolve and shifting in. And what this compaction does is it takes all of those small parquet files, it coalesces them and writes out a single large parquet file and updates the, um, uh, the metadata for parquet or for Iceberg to say that, that there's this new view. You get about a 40% um, performance improvement for some workloads on top of this. A second area where we're seeing a lot of interest and movement is around governance, right? The, the data lake um, uh, sort of development environment wants to use lots and lots of different tools. And so we want developers to move as quickly and as safely as possible. And so today, we're launching S3 access grants. Access grants allow you to bring your own directory service, right, Active Directory or other directory services, integrate them with IAM and use your own principles as part of uh, access control checks to S3 objects. So this is a really, really powerful thing in terms of integrating uh, access into the object store with your own organization directories. One area that's immediately been really popular with customers that have uh, started to use access grants is the ability to perform fine grain audit, right? Accounting accesses to objects in S3 to individual users that are working with the system. Um, we heard from Marianne about how Cox went all in and has built starting from initial footprints into a really rich and robust set of services on top of S3. BMW is another example. They started in 2019 
uh, with an S3 data lake. Today that data lake is three plus petabytes of data and takes vehicle telemetry from 20 million vehicles. Uh, in Adam's talk this morning, we heard from Pfizer in a really similar tone. And so there are these really, really exciting examples of customers that are able to move so fast. And I think that's kind of the, the thing that I would leave with you on this topic of data lakes, which is, it's a technical term, but the place where we see it being most successful is in its organizational implications, right? The ability to establish a center for your data, to think about governance, and to think about being able to move fast and experiment by standing up new teams and using new technologies. So really, really compelling ability. Now, the data lake topic from a storage perspective feeds really directly into AIML and generative AI. And so we can talk about that for, for a few minutes as well. Um, I'm sure that you're hearing a lot about generative AI in talks this week. Um, it's something that, that all of our services are very excited about, and I'm sure you are too. Um, from, a, from a sort of slightly historical perspective, I, I think this is kind of amazing. Just the, the rate of change that we've seen in these machine learning technologies kind of hinges on these three properties, right? The, the ability to build giant data sets that, that was even challenging you know, like a decade and a half ago, the cloud's ability to bring enormous compute to bear on that data, and the renaissance that we've seen in computer science in terms of algorithms to work with this data, especially over the past five or so years. And so if we look at the size of models that customers are building on top of this, it really speaks to the rate of change here, right? Even over the last two years, the, the, the dimensionality of these models in terms of the number of parameters that are being changed is just, it's just skyrocketing. And commensurately, the things that people are doing with these systems is really, really incredible. Um, our view in terms of our storage services and the approach to these um, uh, machine learning technologies is that it maps very closely to the data lake pattern, right? That we expect customers will want to have choice of models, choice of tools, just like they do on analytics, and that they'll want to bring those models and tools to their data, not the opposite. And so that's really from a storage services perspective the way that we're thinking about this. Um, when we look at large scale, um, customers, customers that are training large foundation models using thousands of GPUs over weeks of time, um, we typically see two patterns from a storage perspective. It's, it's typically either FSx for Lustre, which is a file system that was designed for high performance computing, right? It's a large scale at high performance file system, or customers are building directly on top of S3. And it kind of depends on the heritage of your of your environment, right? The, the Lustre community or the customers that are using Lustre tend to be folks that grew up with a cluster file system. They're using tools uh, like SED and Oc to do data prep and they just want to go and, and hack on the data from Linux. The S3 customers often are data lake customers and they, they have a data lake ecosystem of tools around them. And so we're, we're really excited about both of these paths and we're investing in both of them from a storage perspective for generative AI. Um, on the Lustre side, in November, we launched uh, throughput scaling on demand. And so the pattern here that we see is a data science shop that's building a model. We'll have a, lunch, a bunch of developers. They'll be working on the data, and then they'll move into production training, and they'll want to scale up the throughput that's available from the, from the Lustre cluster for the time that they're training. And then when they're done, they'll want to scale it back down right, and not continue to pay for that level of performance. And so this is a really meaningful ability to move performance up and down. On the S3 side, um, there are two really interesting announcements in the context of ML frameworks. The first one is earlier this year, we launched a file connector for S3 called MountPoint, right? This is, uh, uh, it's not full file semantics. It's a lot more like HDFS. It wraps the get and put verbs and allows you to access your data over local um, file APIs. Um, we've launched support for this for Express One Zone, and we get, um, a 6x uh, performance improvement in terms of throughput to, to S3 in here. Uh, the other thing that we've just launched is an S3 connector for PyTorch. PyTorch is uh, probably the most popular right now machine learning framework. And for both checkpointing and data loading, you can now, with this plugin um, or with this connector, directly access data in S3 from PyTorch. Um, the other dimension that I think is kind of fun to, uh, to think about in terms of storage and machine learning workloads is what we're seeing with those customers, those, 
those data lake customers that are moving into um, AI and generative AI is there's often a need for secondary data that they want to bring to integrate with their own data. And AWS has been investing in this ability to gain access to curated uh, great data sets for years. On the left, what you see is AWS Open Data. This is a huge collection of open scientific and otherwise uh, public data sets, right? Things like the common crawl data, which is used extensively for training large language models. On the right, we have AWS Data Exchange, and we've just launched a data category for generative AI. And so with partnerships with organizations like FactSet and Shutterstock, we bring the ability for you to gain paid access to um, um, commercial data sets that are curated in really, really high quality. This is also a place where if your organization has data that you think is valuable for other folks to train off of, there's an opportunity to monetize that through this marketplace of data. I'm just going to close on generative AI with, with two quick points. The first one is that um, anecdotally when we talk to customers that have done a lot of work in this space, one thing that I find surprising, although I guess it's a little bit intuitive retrospectively, is about 80% again, as an anecdote of the work that's involved in building a uh, generative AI application or a sophisticated machine learning application is data preparation, right? It's, it's curating and preparing your data to be used by the tools. And a really remarkable observation is that if you've already built a data lake on top of these storage services, if you're already doing analytics, you're a lot of that 80% of the way there. And so a lot of these tools may be a lot closer and more accessible to you than you realize. And I'd encourage you to just go and look at at what's possible, because you may find that you're a lot closer to doing incredible things than, than you realize. The other thing that I'll point out is I really tried to focus on the storage aspects of these technologies today. Mylan is doing a soup to nuts talk on generative AI on Thursday, and I've seen a preview of this, and it's an incredible talk, and so I'd encourage you to take time to watch that one. Okay. The last thing that I would like to tell you about, uh, because I couldn't resist throwing a little bit more nuts and bolts into the storage update, uh, is to go back into how we build stuff a little bit. Um, across data lakes and generative AI, I've mentioned a bunch of these connectors that data lake customers and folks are using to access data in S3. And there's a thing that is really, really, I think, neat here that we've seen on the storage teams. And the thing is that the S3 team seems to be in the process of kind of redefining what the team perceives the service boundary to be. What I mean by that is it's historically been the REST API, right? Re requests arrive and, and depart the REST API, and that's kind of where storage starts and finishes to the team. And what we've realized as customers are starting to pull us closer to applications is that we need to think about the actual application experience for these things. We need to get like our sleeves rolled up and really work with the other side of the network to make sure that the experience is amazing. And it must be an amazing experience by default. So when we started to talk to customers that were really driving a lot of performance out of S3, we learned that it was possible. I mean, the scale of S3 is enormous, and it's, it's totally possible to drive incredible levels of throughput from the system. But it's a bit of work. And so a few years ago, we actually published a white paper and extended the S3 documentation with these performance best practices. Right? And we talked about parallelizing flows and all sorts of things. To give you a quick sense of, of some of that advice, the observation is things like the S3 front end fleet is thousands and thousands of servers, right? And there's these IP addresses with load balancers and sets of services behind them. But if you only talk to one of those, you're talking to a subset of what's potentially a very, very large fleet. And so if you're pinned and you're stuck on that one and some other clients come along, right? you risk getting into a spot where all the traffic is overloading that host and it would be better to try and distribute it. And that's a client decision. We have to drive that from the client. And as we move to GPU instances, right, in these really, really beefy machines, on a P4 you're seeing 400 gigabits a second of access. On P5s this grazes to uh, 3,200 gigabits of access. Right, it's a lot of traffic off of a single NIC. And so there's an example of the P4 actually uh, back end. You can kind of see the cabling, right, that, that we're putting into these, these GPU instances. And so it's far better, and the performance best practices advise that you spread the traffic over the surface of the fleet. 
And you need to watch the behavior of the fleet because it's a distributed system. Some things, sometimes things don't go as well as we wish they would. Sometimes there's you know, traffic uh, at some links. And, and so it's important on the client side because it's the best vantage point for it to track that stuff. And so we weren't satisfied with documenting this. right? We really felt that it needed to go further. And so the AWS SDK team has a bunch of like absolutely amazing folks. And we worked with them really closely on making this the default experience. The SDK team produced a library. It's a native code library called the CRT, the Common Runtime. And the CRT takes all of those performance best practices and it wraps them up and it makes them automatic and it sets the goal for itself of being able to automatically saturate the NIC with S3 transfer performance. And what we've been doing is linking the CRT in underneath the CLI, the SDKs, and these various connectors that we built. And so today, by default, the CRT is now enabled in the CLI and in Bodo, which is the Python connector, for all of our machine learning instances. And we'll be rolling it out in other instance types. It's a, behind a feature flag, so you can turn it on today as we move forward. Um, transfers with the, the CRT turned on under the CLI are five times faster um, than directly accessing through the SDK without it. Mount point launched earlier. This is the file connector for S3 that I mentioned. And we've just launched internal caching for mount point. And so if you have reaccess to data during training or other workloads, you now have the option to cache data on the local instance SSD, for example, reducing your request costs and further reducing latency. There are other CRT-based clients. I mentioned the connector for PyTorch. We've also just launched a CSI driver to make mount point available under uh, all of the um, uh, container interfaces under Kubernetes. And so the bottom line with, oh, sorry, um, Continental is an example customer that's used mount point. Continental saw their simulation workload speed up by 20% and a 40% cost reduction just moving over to run directly against S3 with mount point. This is something that you should expect to see us continue to do. All of these connectors um, have been a really, really rewarding and powerful investment, I think, in working closer to the clients. We're doing a, almost all of this work actually in open source, and so it's, it's there for you to participate in or, or send uh, feature requests to. Um, and all of it works with both S3 and with today's launch of um, S3 Express. And so let's, let's wrap things up. Um, I started by talking about continuous invisible innovation in our storage services. That's something that's absolutely our focus. I shifted to talk about how we aim to deliver performance for every single workload and talked about the launch of S3 Express One Zone. We heard from Marianne Johnson about Cox's journey into the cloud. Um, and then we talked about enterprise migrations, data lakes, and generative AI as directions that our teams are really focused on anticipating customer needs for and making sure that the storage performance behavior and the storage experience is just incredible out of the gates. And then we indulged a little bit more in some internals around the work that we're doing with clients for S3. I hope that if I can leave you with anything, that this is what you should expect in building over AWS storage services. That our services and the teams that build them are just focused, absolutely focused, on continuing to listen and improve the behavior of these services over time. And like those 15-year-old EBS volumes, you should expect to continue to see these massive strides in terms of the, the capabilities that we're building for storage. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the event. <laughs>